Thanks very much, uh, Chris. My, my mother always said be very wary of lawyers and veterinarians, and I find myself on a panel with two vets and a lawyer. I am neither, but I am from the RSPCA. Um, and for those of you that are not aware, the RSPCA takes about 83% of the prosecution and enforcement activities under the Animal Welfare Act in England and Wales. So we have an awful lot of data. Um, and I'm going to present you some of the data that we've got in 10 minutes um, on cats, dogs, um, and horses. And uh, I, I particularly like the way that the red light flashed against Mike's tie. It, it actually showed up almost like a Christmas decoration. So I'm very wary of, of getting that particular thing happening to me. So um, Mike's gone through a lot of this uh, before, so I'm, not, I'm going to skip over this. But the government, when they, when they published the Animal Welfare Bill in 2005, they set out four things that they expected it to do. To simplify legislation, to prevent uh, suffering, including the welfare section nine, uh, to prevent by deterring persistent offenders, um, and to set up the welfare codes and therefore to prevent using section nine and to do the secondary legislation. Mike's very adequately covered the secondary legislation, and I think uh, we'd give the governments, probably in all sectors, probably about three, four out of ten for that. Um, but England, um, I'm sure because we are approaching the tenth anniversary, has suddenly woken up to the fact that they haven't got any secondary legislation and are now rushing it through, which is really good news. So... Um, we've talked a lot about understanding of Animal Welfare Act. Mike mentioned it. It was mentioned this morning. Um, and it's always traditional, of course, to, uh, to uh, name check the PDSA's poor report. So I'm doing that in my presentation as well. Thank you very much, PDSA. Um, this shows, as we saw this morning, the very poor understanding of the public on the Animal Welfare Act and their familiarity with it. The only interesting thing that I show from this is that there is a slightly bigger awareness in Wales, 45%, compared to the, the largest one in England of 41%. And I'm going to be uh, slightly simplistic here, but Wales um, did do two things which were different to England. Uh, firstly, they did actually print out, rather than just put on their website, the, uh, the Animal Welfare Act codes. Uh, and the RSPCA distributed um, thousands of these codes in Wales, um, but, uh, but we didn't distribute any um, in England apart from two people that came across us as, as people that were breaking the law. The second thing is, and I th I'm, I'm being slightly crass here, but it is an interesting point. Wales in their welfare codes had pictures. England does not. Um, and hopefully, when, when England, England is now reviewing their codes, um, and the, uh, the sector council on, on canine and feline sector council has said to, to DEFRA, it would be a good idea to have pictures, because people like pictures. So what about trends in prosecutions? So the, these are, let's first look at trends in populations. Over the last 10 years, probably not much change in terms of, terms of trends in populations. I've put the horse population as pretty well flatlining around a million because we don't have very good data on that. But dog and cat population haven't really gone up, probably from around 7.5 to about 8.5 million. But there hasn't been a huge amount of change in the population of these animals. So therefore, you wouldn't expect much change in the enforcement of these particular laws. But if you look at um, the, the legislation and what we're seeing in enforcement, what we've clearly seen here is... You can, you can see here, what we've got here is a hump. So when the, when the Animal Welfare Act came in in 2007, the RSPCA said that we believed it would rise about 10% in prosecutions um, as Section 9 and the welfare offence bedded in. As you can see here, by 2011-12, it had risen by about three times. And then, in the last three years, it has crashed by 55%. And I'll go through that for each individual animal. But you'll see for dogs, um, cats and horses, pretty much the same trend has happened. An increase from about 2010 to 2012, and then a crash of about 55%. Now... We are pretty similar, and in some respects, for dogs, we are actually below the um, prosecution and conviction rate than we were in 2007. So why has this happened? Um, firstly, uh, obviously, what did happen in 2009 was a global recession. Um, and I think that is very important, particularly for high, expensive animals like horses. They are difficult, they are expensive to keep, 
And if you've got a recession, if you've lost your job, what's the first thing you'll do is you'll cut back on costs. What are the two most important things for you to cut back on? I'm sorry here to the vets, but the first thing is cut back on vet costs because they're quite expensive. And the second thing is to try and get land or food cheap. And I think that is what is happening here. And what's therefore brought about this 55% reduction in the last three years? Could it whisper it, but could it be education? OK, so let's look at the issues for dogs. Um, so for, for dogs, we have got here the, um, the amount of welfare notices that the RSPCA has, uh, has served um, and the amount of prosecutions that, that we've had. And as you can see, um, the amount of welfare notices um, have been going down since 2011. Unfortunately, I don't have the data pre-2011, but the amount of welfare notices have been going down. And this is your hump here around 2012, 2013, and this is your 55% drop here. We know from the welfare notices, even though they're not statutory, our, our notices are not statutory in England and Wales, but we know from our data that they are 90, 95% compliant, i.e. nine and a half people out of the 10 people that we serve those notices on comply with them. That has to be a good educational thing. When we do take prosecutions on dogs um, under Section 9, um, and you'll see this for cats and for horses, the main one is, is on uh, pain, which is the veterinarian issue, and then we get um, environment, um, and then we get diet. And you can see here, clearly, this is, these are Section 9 prosecutions, you can see here clearly the hump occurring around 2010, 11, 12, and then the drop-off occurring. So not only have we had a drop-off for Section 4, which is cruelty, but we've also had a drop-off for Section 9, which is the welfare needs. OK, on to cats. Obviously, dogs are uh, the most important animal that, that we enforce in terms of uh, the numbers. Uh, probably about 60% of the animals that, that we, uh, we have to prosecute under are dogs. Um, interesting case. Why is that? Because dogs are probably less in population than cats, but obviously they are more visible than cats. Um, and there is also a question, I think that would be interesting to look at, in terms of whether uh, we actually know more about the welfare needs of dogs and people know more about how dogs should be kept than cats. But I'll toss that out there for further discussion. So let's look at what's happened with, with cats. Same, same two things, welfare notices and prosecutions. Um, the interesting thing with cats here is that we have seen actually a slight rise in the number of welfare notices, still getting about 90, 95% success rate with them. And this is your 55% drop in the prosecutions. Um, and, and obviously, your, your database is much, much lower for cats, but you can still see the same things. Pain, which is the veterinarian issue, number one, followed by environment, and then followed by diet. Although with cats, they are fairly close together. So, horses. Um, interesting thing about horses, two, two interesting things. Number one is they're visible. And so you tend to get more complaints uh, from the public on horses than other issues, than other species, but that's because you can see them more clearly. And number two, um, horses tend to look miserable a lot of the time, so most people tend to think that they are suffering or they're having a bad day, particularly when it's raining and they're standing outside. And, and as I said earlier on, obviously it costs an awful lot more to take care of a horse so if you lose your job and you've got a horse, therefore, you're in far worse condition than if you lose your job and you've got a cat or a dog, I would say. Here you can see the big hump in welfare notices, um, and we've seen a drop here. And this is your big 55% drop in prosecutions for horse cases in the past three years. Uh, and on, uh, on the uh, Section 9 offences, again, the same thing. You're seeing this big, big rise and then the drop. Um, slightly more than cats in terms of numbers, but, but you're still seeing this pattern emerging. So, um, why is that? Um, we all know some of the problems that the animal welfare hasn't got. It doesn't have a statutory enforcement agency, um, and there are certain things that, that the government should be doing to improve the Animal Welfare Act, and I'm really hoping that the EFRA inquiry, which is a fantastic opportunity to do this, will come up with some fantastic recommendations. Um, and I'm not going to go through those in any great detail because that is really what EFRA will be doing at the moment. Um, the RSPCA has, has submitted comprehensive evidence to EFRA on what we believe should be happening with the Animal Welfare Act. And if anyone wants to read that, it's all on the EFRA website. 
So why are educational messages failing? I think what we've seen over this day is that actually a lot of people do a lot of work on education, but actually we don't know who we're trying to educate, what they're listening to, and how we actually get the message across to them to be educated. And very simply, we know, for instance, for dogs, that it is almost impossible to educate people about buying dogs properly. We know that they should be looking for the bitch with the pup. We know that they should be looking at sick animals. But when you're faced with these three individuals looking at you with their eyes, you're going to go, yeah, I think I'll have three of those, thanks very much. Here's 700 pounds. Oh, where are you going? Bye-bye. So is it any wonder that our educational messages are failing because buying an animal is not a rational decision. It's not like buying a fridge. It is an emotional purchase. And once you've decided that you want to be like Paris Hilton, God help you, I'm sure there's nobody here that wants to be like Paris Hilton, but once you've decided that you want to be like her and have a handbag chihuahua, there is nothing going to stand in your way, certainly not educational messages from the RSPCA, because you ain't going to go on our website to see them. So, why are educational messages failing in horses? Actually, I actually think educational messages are getting through to horse, um, to horse owners. In the last three years, not only have we seen a drop in prosecutions, we've seen a drop in horses being fly-grazed, and we've seen a drop in poor welfare. Here, in 2015, we had the Control of Horses Act in England, and I think that has made, started to make a big difference. Obviously, there's only a million horse owners, so maybe we can actually get that educational message through to them clearly. I think with them, it's less of an emotional purchase. They are the people that we can be educating. And as you can see here with horses, I think it is starting to work. With cats as well, the RSPTA is working very closely with cats protection. And again, we are starting to get much cleverer and smarter at how we're looking at this. And I think we are starting to see some results coming through. Why are educational messages failing? This is the reason why. These are, these are mobile phones from a puppy dealer. Um, and in case you're wondering what it says on these mobile phones, it says Pomeranian, West Highland Terrier, Cockapoo, and, and, uh, and the rest here. And this refers to the advert. So the poor person that is thinking they're going to get a Cockapoo or a West Highland Terrier from a breeder, and they will know exactly what they're doing, they will ring that number, and actually they're getting a puppy dealer whose number calls, and they know exactly, because it's written on the back in big capital letters, that they are supposed to be selling them a cockapoo. So they will answer the phone and say, yes, hello, cockapoo breeder, how are you doing? That is the reason why educational messages fail. So, in summary, because I'm now flashing, and I don't want to look like a Christmas tree, did it simplify the legislation? Yep. It did. Did it prevent? Yes, I think it did prevent. We are starting to see educational messages. Did it deter persistent offenders? Absolutely not. Because don't forget that there are two sorts of people that break the law. There are the uneducated people, and yes, you can educate them. And I would say that the statutory notices and the improvement notices that are put out by APHA or the non-statutory ones put out by the RSPCA are there to educate, and they are really the most important educational tool. Does it prevent? Well, the jury's out, but it'd be interesting to see if that downward trend continues. And secondary legislation, I'm going to be more generous than Mike here. I think we've had um, a big hiatus on secondary legislation, but I'm with the government, and I think that we're going to see much more coming forward, certainly this year with, with pet vending, but also in the other devolved administrations as well. Thank you.